Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to today's program. My name is Rick Renner. I've been sitting in this chair waiting for our time together. And today you and I are going to return to the wonderful book of Jude, where Jude begins to write about believers and churches becoming apostate in the very end of the age. And actually Jude had intended to write an entirely different kind of epistle. In verse 3, he says he really wanted to write a letter about salvation. And the reason he wanted to write a letter about salvation is because his elder half-brother was Jesus who died on the cross. And through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus obtained so many blessings for us. And that was very near to the heart of Jude, and that's what he really wanted to write about. But someone gave him a copy of Peter's second epistle, and when he read what Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 2 about false prophets and false teachers clandestinely working their way into the church and abusing the saints, Jude was so moved and so disturbed by what he read that he scrapped his plans to write a letter about our blessings in Christ and decided instead that he would also address this issue of people becoming apostate in the very end of the age. In fact, he said, I found it needful, the Greek word anagke, which means I felt an urgent necessity. I had to do this. I was moved. I just had to respond. And then he begins to build on top of what he read in Peter's epistle, chapter 2, about false prophets and false teachers and apostate leaders and believers in the church at the very end of the age. But all of that is what we're covering last week, this week, and the next two weeks in a brand new series this week that I'm offering you is called The Apostate Church. Apostate ministers and apostate believers how to recognize apostate leaders and churches and how to stay spiritually on fire for the Lord. I'm not asking you to go hunt for apostate people. We just need to know what the Bible says is going to happen at the very end of the age. And the Bible clearly says many are going to depart from the faith. And that is what Jude addresses. And that's what we cover in this series this week. And it comes with a study guide. And right now we're also offering you my book, which is called How to Keep Your Head on Straight in a World Gone Crazy. The foreword is written by my friend, John Bevere. But at the end of the program, my announcer is going to tell you how you can get all of these teaching materials. But let me tell you first, before we get into the teaching, that if you need prayer, call us right now or send us an email. We love to pray for people who reach out to us. And if you've ever called us before, you know you don't get off the phone until somebody has really prayed for you. We believe Matthew 18, 19, where Jesus said, if two of you will as agree as touching anything, I'll do it. We'll get into agreement with you in prayer and Jesus will move in your life. So let us know how to pray for you by calling us right now or by going online and reach for your Bible. Get a pencil or an ink pen, something to write with, because today I believe you're really going to want to take notes and we're going to return to the book of Jude. And today we're going to begin again in verse six. Well, in the book of Jude, Jude is addressing those apostate leaders who think somehow they're going to escape the judgment of God. They've twisted the grace of God into a doctrine that says everything is okay, even though it is not okay. And they've said, well, we're under grace. God is not going to judge us. And Jude begins to give specific examples of judgment. And today we're going to look again at verse 6 about angels who were judged. It's almost like he says, what do you mean you're not going to be judged? Even angels were judged for wrong behavior. And in Jude verse 6, he writes, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. And the RIV says it like this. Here's another example of something you should remember. I'm talking about the angels that did not stay at the posts God assigned to them. Instead of staying at their God-assigned posts, they abandoned their own dwelling places and high-ranking dominions that had been assigned to them. But God has not abandoned His post. 
And he's standing guard over those rebellious angels and has eternally put them in chains under bleak darkness under the big day of judgment in the future. That's the RIV of Jude verse 6. But then we move to Jude verse 7. And in Jude 7 we read from the King James Version, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So now he gives us another example of judgment. And the RIV has verse 7 like this. But wait, here is another example you need to remember. I'm talking about what happened with Sodom and Gomorrah for what happened to them and the surrounding cities all around them is similar to what happened to the angels that deserted the pre-designed post God planned for them. In like manner, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah left what was natural and gave themselves over to fornication and to follow after feelings, instincts, mannerisms, and urges that were not natural. Deviant mutations that resulted in departing from natural behaviors and they morally reverted backwards as they strangely engaged with those of the same sex. What happened to the people of those cities are placed before us as a clear pattern of what is coming in the future when the mallet in God's court of law will be dropped and an irreversible verdict will be issued that results in the guilty being subjected to a fire that eternally engulfs them. That's a very good version of Jude, verse 7. But now we come to verse 8. And in verse 8, Jude begins addressing these apostate leaders in the church, and notice how he describes them. Likewise also, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. But notice in verse 8, he begins with the word likewise. It means in like manner, similarly, also, by the way, the word also is very important, the Greek word mentoi, which here carries the idea of something so outrageous that it is shocking and stunning, outrageously, shockingly, these filthy dreamers. Well, the King James Version has the word filthy, but in fact, that does not appear in the Greek text. It simply says these dreamers. And the word dreamers here is very important because it shares a root with the word hypnos, which is where we get the word for hypnosis. Hypnosis. I'm going to read to you from my notes. Here, it depicts one who is under the controlling influence of his own mind or his own thinking or his own dreams, or it pictures one that has convinced himself or hypnotized himself to believe something incorrect is actually okay. Though one may claim that it is revelation, in fact, this word dreamers tells us it is delusionary. It is a hallucination. There's nothing right about it. But they've convinced themselves or almost hypnotized themselves to believe what is wrong really might be all right. But it goes on to say these dreamers defile the flesh. And the word defile is the Greek word miaimno, which means to contaminate to spot, to spill, to stain, to taint, and it pictures something that is negatively affected to the point of being ruined or spoiled. They defile the flesh and, the Bible says, despise dominions and speak evil of dignities. The word despise is a Greek word which means, listen very carefully, this will sound very familiar to you, to disregard, to nullify to ignore, to rebuff, to reject, or to cancel. It describes a cancel culture. That's really what it describes. It is the attitude and actions of one who breaks faith with those that are in spiritual authority and arrogantly and rudely and subversively cancels, disannuls, or mocks those in honorable positions who should be given honor and respect. It means to cancel. They're just going to cancel those that they don't like. And the word dominions that is used in verse 8 is the Greek word kuriotes, which genuinely describes anyone that is in a position of authority. And actually, my friends, we're living in a day 
when if you are in a position of authority, you better get ready for somebody to come against you because everyone in a position of authority today is under assault. And Jude here prophesies that would happen in the end of the age. And he even says it's going to happen inside the church when those that have veered from the faith are going to try to cancel those who have stuck with their old way of believing. Wow. Then he goes on to say they speak evil of dignities. Speak evil is a form of the Greek word blasphemia, which is where we get the word for blasphemy. You could translate they blaspheme dignities. That this word speak evil, the Greek word blasphemia, means to slander, to accuse, to speak against, or to speak derogatory words for the purpose of injuring or harming someone else's reputation. It is any derogatory speech intended to defame, to injure, to harm. It includes nasty, shameful, ugly speech, again, intended to humiliate someone or to put someone else down. It is the equivalent of saying, ah, oh, they're just relics of the past. They've been teaching that thing forever. Ignore them. It's the belittling of somebody else. And the Bible says they will speak evil of dignities, the word dignities, is the Greek word doxas, which describes the glorious ones, the honorable ones. It is those who have walked in faith and have led us for a long time, those in authority who are worthy of honor and respect. But rather than honor them, they debase them and they belittle them. And the RIV of verse 8 is like this. In the very same identical way, these dreamers have shockingly convinced themselves that what they do and condone is all right. They go about defiling the flesh and they show total disregard to those with authority. And out of a complete disdain for spiritual authority, they audaciously speak debasing, nasty, shameful, ugly words toward those that are in spiritual authority with the purpose of belittling them and putting them down. And of course, this is totally inappropriate behavior. Then you come to verse 9, and Jude basically says, even angels don't talk to each other the way these people are speaking about their spiritual leaders. When you come to verse 9, he says, yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Well, in the very first of verse 9, it begins in the King James Version with the word yet. This word yet is the Greek word day. It is a conjunction intended to make an amazing, categorical, emphatic statement. Amazingly, Michael the archangel. Archangel is a compound of two Greek words, the word archo and the word angelos. The word archo describes a leader, a prince, or a chief. The word angelos is the Greek word for an angel. But when you compound these two words together, it forms the word archangel. And in this particular text, it also has a definite article, which means the chief, the leader, the prince, the ruling angel who had tremendous authority and power, hence a mighty and powerful archangel. And actually, if you study the activity of Michael throughout the Bible, you find that Michael the archangel was entrusted with the assignment to hold back evil and to hold back dark powers. You can see an example of that in Daniel chapter 10, verse 13. He is the force that holds back evil. But this verse says, yet, amazingly, even Michael, the tremendously powerful archangel, when contending with the devil. The word when, the Greek word hote, it points backward in time to a specific moment when something really took place. And this is the only place in scripture where we read about this. Yet Jude vividly tells us that a concentration took place between the archangel and Michael over the body of Moses when Moses died. And it says that Michael the archangel durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but simply said, the Lord rebuke thee. That all that took place when he was contending over the body of Moses. And if you look at this word contending, which we see in the King James Version in verse 9, in Greek, it is a word and a tense 
that conveys the idea of a prolonged dispute, a wrangling or going back and forth over an issue. And according to verse 9, Michael the archangel was wrangling and going back and forth with the devil. And in Greek, it has a definite article, not any devil, but the devil himself. The word devil, the Greek word diabolos, it describes one who casts a net in order to ensnare. And here we find that Satan wanted to pull Michael the archangel into a verbal dispute. But Michael refused to go too deeply into it. In fact, the verse goes on to say that when this dispute was taking place, the word dispute, the Greek word dia legomai. The word dia again carries the idea of a going back and forth, and it's used as an intensifier in this word. The word lego means I say. When you compound the two words together, it forms the Greek word dia legomai, which in the King James Version is translated disputed. But really it portrays a prolonged and fierce disputation or a wrangling back and forth over something. But the Bible goes on to say, hmm, he durst not bring against him a railing accusation. And the word durst, the Greek word told mao, which means to inappropriately cross a line and do what is not acceptable, to dare to go where no one should ever go, which means even Michael the archangel knew it was not right to verbally cross a line and even be rude to the devil. That's really what it means. Wow. Durst not bring against him. By the way, the word not, the Greek word ouk, it is the strongest form of no. Durst not, he absolutely did not bring against him. Bring against, to form the Greek word epi. Pharaoh, which means to bring against, to cast against, to impose, or to inflict with pain. He chose not to inflict the devil with pain by bringing against him a railing accusation from the Greek word crisis. It describes a crisis or a judgment, but simply said, the Lord rebuke thee. And there's something in the Greek text that is not in the King James Version it says bringing against him a railing accusation with blasphemy. Again, the word blasphemy means to speak derogatory speech against someone else with a purpose to humiliate and to belittle them. Even though Michael the archangel could have done that, he refrained from doing it, but instead said, the Lord rebuke you. And the word Lord, the Greek word kurios, describes the Lord, the supreme master, and it pictures Jesus as the one with ultimate authority in the known realm, the unknown realm, the visible realm, and the invisible realm. He said, the Lord, the one with ultimate authority, he rebuke you. And the word rebuke, the Greek word epi tamel. The word epi means against, and it also carries the idea of superiority over someone else. The word tamel is the Greek word for something that's honorable, something that's prized, or something that is cherished. But when you compound the two words together, epitamau is translated rebuke, and listen to what it means. It pictures one verbally belittling, verbally censoring, chiding, rebuking, reprimanding, or reproving another with the intention to assault his esteem or self-appraised attitude. Rather than Michael do that, Rather than Michael be dragged into a verbal wrangling with the devil, he simply said, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord stepped in and the Lord dealt with the enemy. The Lord rebuke you. And the word you is the direct form soy, which means directly to you. Michael stepped out of the way. The Lord began to speak to the devil himself. And verse 9 in the RIV says, I tell you amazingly, I tell you amazingly that even Michael, the tremendously powerful archangel, at the moment when he was wrangling and going back and forth with the devil in a fierce and really hot debate concerning the body of Moses, even he did not cross the line and get into judgment with the devil, nor did he try to take retribution against him nor did he get dragged into speaking insulting and humiliating words in an attempt to inflict the devil with pain. But instead, he simply said, the Lord rebuke you. But then when you come to verse 10, Jude adds, but these 
Who is these? These apostate leaders, these apostate believers that have veered from the truth, these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brood beasts in those things in which they corrupt themselves. And in verse 10, the word but is the Greek word day, which again carries the idea of something that is emphatic or categorical. Amazingly, these speak evil. Speak evil, the Greek word blasphemy, which again means to blaspheme, to speak derogatory words with the intention of belittling or humiliating someone else. Of those things which they know not, the word know is the Greek word oida, which means to see, to perceive, or to comprehend, to know by personal observation They don't see it. They don't comprehend it. They don't understand it. Then he uses the little word not, the Greek word ouk. Emphatically, they do not understand. But what they know naturally, the word naturally, the Greek word phusikos, which means to operate from the lowest base instinct, almost like an animal. And that's why he adds as brute beasts. The word as, the Greek word host, means exactly like brute beasts, brute beasts. In Greek is the word zoon. The word zoon means living animals. And interestingly, it is where we get the word for a zoo. There's a little indication here. These people should not be roaming the streets. They're so wild. They're so disrespectful. They should be caged and put behind bars because of their spiritual behavior. And then he adds, as brute beasts in those things that corrupt themselves. The words in those things is a translation of the Greek word epistemi, which describes something that's sustained over a long period of time, or something that's become one's prolonged existence, one station or standing in life. I'm going to put all this together for you in just a moment. And he says, in those things that they've been doing for a long, long time, in their standing and station in life, they corrupt themselves. The word corrupt describes that which is corrupt, degenerate, depraved, rotten, ruined, or ruinous. And the RIV of verse 10 says, But the people I'm talking to you about right now speak atrociously, inappropriately, about things they absolutely do not comprehend or even have a clue about. To be honest, they know and operate from a natural, low-level instinct, a lot like animals that lack intelligence. That explains why they're standing in life is so degenerate, depraved, and totally messed up. Wow. All of that is in verse 10, and we're out of time. But in just a moment, my announcer is going to tell you how you can order the brand new series called The Apostate Church. Be sure to order it and let us know how to pray for you. And I'll be back in just a moment, and I want to pray for you. In Rick Brenner's new series, The Apostate Church, Apostate Ministers and Apostate Believers, hidden truths are unpacked from the book of Jude that tell us many will become apostate at the end of the age as they veer from the truth. The Bible explicitly says this will occur, so we need to know how to never be counted among those who become apostate. In this brand new series, Rick clearly shows that God graciously gives divine warnings to those who err, examples of divine judgment, and his pronouncement of judgment upon wandering stars. Rick also answers the questions, what is a wandering star, and what is God's verdict upon the rebellious and upon the apostate church? This five-part series is available in digital or physical format starting at just $10. And today we're also offering you Rick's book, How to Keep Your Head on Straight in a World Gone Crazy for $20. Rick says, I urge you to get this book because it is so needed for the days we are living in right now. In this book, you'll discover what you need to be doing to stay anchored to truth, how to discern right and wrong teaching, and how to be spiritually prepared for living victoriously in these last days. Rick will take you deep into New Testament prophecies about the end of the age and what you need to do to sail successfully through turbulent end time waters. Order the series, The Apostate Church, Apostate Ministers and Apostate Believers, and the book, How to Keep Your Head on Straight in a World Gone Crazy. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Friends, this is Rick Renner and I'm standing inside what's going to be the new studio in our TV studio in Moscow. You have given to make this happen. And right now, as you know, prices in Russia are just 
skyrocketing because of what's taking place in our part of the world. I want to say thank you to every one of you that have done something sacrificial to help us buy all the materials we need to finish the interior. We need to wrap this up as fast as we can. Proverbs 10, 21 says, the lips of the righteous feed many. And I want you to understand that from this spot, we're going to feed people all over the world the Word of God. It's not about a building. We're not interested in buildings. This is an anchor that is pivotal for the proclamation and the distribution of the Word of God to this entire part of the world, and it is so, so needed. And by being a partner with us and being a part of our giving team to wrap this up, every time the signal goes with the Word of God into people's private spaces all over this part of the world, God is going to credit you with part of the reward for what's going to happen because it's your seed, it's your offerings, it's your sacrifices that are helping us to do this. And when people's lives are transformed, it will be credited to your account. And I want to say thank you for everything that you've already done. Thank you for helping us wrap up phase two of this very important project so we can begin to film programs right here and get the teaching of the Bible to people that are famished for it. And I want to say thank you in advance for being a part of our giving team. My friend, I feel like we've just been flying through these verses today. These verses are just jam-packed, and I want to unpack every one of those words for you because they're so powerful. And I want you to get the brand new series, which is called The Apostate Church, Apostate Ministers and Apostate Believers, and How to Recognize Apostate Leaders and Churches and How to Stay Spiritually on Fire for the Lord. If this is going to happen in the end of the age, and the Bible says it is, we do not want to be apostate. So please order this series now and remember that it comes with a study guide. And right now we're also offering you my book, which is called How to Keep Your Head on Straight in a World Gone Crazy. Read this book. You ought to buy two so you can give one to somebody else. This book can be a lifesaver for somebody. And when you become a partner with our ministry, and a partner is anyone who financially supports our ministry, so we can take the teaching of the Bible to the ends of the earth. What you're receiving where you are, someone else needs. And when you become a partner, you put fuel in the tank financially so we can take this teaching around the world. If you're already a partner, thank you. If you're not, please become a partner today and we'll immediately send you my book, Life in the Combat Zone, and Denise's book, The Gift of Forgiveness, because we give these two books to everyone that is a part of our partner family. But I want to pray for you. Father, help us to stay on fire, to burn with the Holy Spirit, that we would not veer from the truth, that we would be respectful of spiritual authority and not fall into this trap of disrespect for authority that's going to be so prevalent in the last days. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you for being with me. I'll be back here tomorrow to continue. But until then... Remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there's power.